So, uh, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, session of the Prevera Machine Learning Lunch se uh, Seminars. Actually, this is uh, the last uh, seminar um, of the year. Today we have with us Professor Carlos Suarez. His talk will be uh, entitled Machine Learning Inception, Understanding Where and Why Models Work and Don't Work. Professor Carlos Suarez is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Engineering of the University of Porto where he holds the positions of Subdirector of the Department of Informatics Engineering, Director of the PhD Program in Informatics Engineering, and the Adjunct Director of the Master of Science Program in Data Science and Engineering. Uh, Carlos also teaches at Porto Business School, where he is the co-director of the Executive Program of Business Intelligence and Analytics, and he also collaborates with the uh, Front Offer and uh, in Tech. Thank you, Professor, for accepting our invitation. It's a big honor for us to have you here and a big pleasure for me in particular, uh, because I was your student, as you know, and I know how good your work is and how good your talks are. So please, when you're ready, uh, you can start. So thank you. Thank you, Diogo. Thank you for inviting me, first of all. And uh, also thank you for kind words, uh, which I probably very exaggerated, but uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, it's it's a big pleasure for me to be here. I think uh, I had no collaborations. I've never collaborated with Pribaran, but uh, now I think we have good news. And uh, with the new Center for Responsible AI, I think uh, uh, more collaboration will come in the future. And uh, since this is the last talk of the season, so I guess everybody's more focused into their holidays and finishing whatever they have to finish before going on holidays. I promise this is going to be a very short talk, also because uh, this is uh, unpublished work yet. And in fact, this is work that I've done myself with my colleagues. So basically most of my research nowadays is done by PhD and master students. So they get to have all the funds, all the fun, and I have to do all the paperwork and boring stuff, boring management stuff. But in this case, this is, was an idea that I, uh, together with uh, Paulo Zviet from the University of Minho and uh, Luis Toro from Dalhousie University and also from the University of Porto, we had this idea. So we met in Canada uh, beginning of the year for two weeks to work on it. So we actually did the coding, the experiments, everything. So. It was a lot of fun, but the end result was also that when I came back, all the management work fell on uh, on top of me again, and uh, we're struggling to finish it. Um, so um, this, so as you will say, I, I'm, I, I'm a lecturer at the University of Porto, and uh, I'm also a researcher at LIAC, which is the, the, the AI Institute at, of, of the University of Porto. And recently I've been uh, collaborating as external advisor for intelligence systems with Fraunhofer. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today is this idea of trying to understand better the behavior of algorithms. And I'll try to, to, to motivate why this is a concern to me. And uh, I will first talk a little bit about what we call the microscopic view of model performance. Uh, then uh, I'm going to introduce a very short introduction to meta learning and then how to use meta learning uh, to uh, what we call a microscopic view of algorithm performance rather than model performance. Uh, meta learning, in this case, you're going to see is maybe a little bit different from what you're uh, uh, used to seeing. Um, because the, the, recently the name has been used in a different, uh, for a different, uh, to illustrate or to name a different concept. But, um, uh, but I think I'll, I'll, I can explain it quickly. <clears throat> so uh, this is what a, most of the papers nowadays look like. And there, so if, if you look at the results section of a, most of the papers, they look like this. And to be honest, it's really boring. And, uh, and for me, the most disappointing thing is that back uh, in the late 90s, essentially, but maybe earlier than that, I started working in the, area in the mid 90s. 
But uh, most of the papers were things like, you know, you, you developed a variant of a decision tree, you tried on four UCI data sets, which were basically toy data sets, and you, or your decision tree variant was better than the previous state of the art in decision trees, and you claimed that your algorithm was better than the previous one. So it's kind of disappointing that uh, almost 30 years have gone by and uh, still the papers look pretty much the same. And to be honest, I'm, my, my papers and my students' papers also look like this, to be honest, but uh, let's see if we can, we can, we can change it. And uh, one of the things that I don't like about this is that these numbers that we get here, numbers, uh, on a few data sets, what they really represent is it, they are one number that represents an average of some kind of predictive performance. Uh, it could be mean squared error in regression, it could be AUC in classification, it could be any other thing, you know, you, you, and it, it's, it's in the average, uh, it's an average number over a data set, over a sample from a population. And as usual, averages are very important. They represent the population, but they are not perfect. They lose information when you, when you compute the average. And in, in this particular case, uh, in the case of uh, learning algorithms, what very often happens is that the averages actually are hiding very interesting information. So for instance, if this was a classification problem where I'm trying to discriminate between circles and crosses, uh, you know, there is, if I try a kind of a decision tree and I try a linear discriminant kind of algorithm, uh, there are areas of the data set which are clearly more suitable for the decision tree like this one, while there are other areas of the data set where they are clearly more uh, uh, suitable for the linear discriminant. Well, while other areas are not so interesting because they kind of represent the average. So what we mean by a micro microscopic view of model performance is not only look at the average performance of the algorithm on a data set, and of course that's important because you know when you when you sell a project to a customer, you, you, your your agreement or your goals are in terms of average performance. But it's also important, I believe, to understand in what areas the data set works, the algorithm that you're going to use works better, and what areas it doesn't work as as well. Um, this is actually. Uh, I believe that, and we've seen this kind of trend where uh, people are more and more concerned about understanding uh, how models work. Why is this decision made? But it's also important to get this more global view of how it works, not for a particular, we don't want the average across the whole data set. We don't want one particular decision but we would like to understand what are the regions where the model works better and the model doesn't work as well. Um, and my guess is that sooner or later, the European Union is going to force us to do that. So every time you deploy a machine learning model, my guess is that you will be uh, forced by law to add kind of a technical sheet associated to, to, to this model. Uh, the current term I think most people use are model cards. But you can think of them as a, a technical sheet of a product. So for instance, if you buy a, a, uh, uh, a toaster, you know, it says on the technical sheet that it must work under uh, you know, some assumptions about electrical current, assumptions about temperature. So all, all these assumptions are made uh, uh, to uh, make sure that you use the model, to use the toaster properly. In the same way, I believe that we're going to need similar uh, uh, mechanisms for machine learning uh, models. And uh, uh, second here, I cannot see the, okay, that's better. Um, 
much better. Okay, so there has been some work in this direction, understanding um, the behavior of models in different uh, parts of the data, of the, the, the space, the data space. Uh, some work by my colleagues, by Luis Torgo and Paulo Azevedo, together with Inés Ariosa, who was a, a student of theirs. And uh, there's also some work by Walter Dauverstein from the Technical University of Eindhoven that does similar uh, thing. And what they did was they applied these subgroup discovery methods that come up with rules such as, you know, if the, in this area of the data space, uh, the linear model will be better than the decision tree. And in this area of the data space, the decision tree will be better than the linear model. By the way, if anybody has any questions, please just open your mic and, and, and ask. And of course, this area is not as important because you get sort of the average performance. So what they did is basically, so they, 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 they use a subgroup discovery algorithm and they, uh, instead of having the labels of the, the, um, the examples, they used, of course, whether the predictions were correct or not. And you would get, and you get rules like this. Now, this is, of course, this is very useful for the end user of the model because these variables x1 and x2 are the same variables in the original data set. So if you're talking about uh, health data, this could be, I don't know, the age of the patient and you know the temperature of the patient, or uh, this could be if we're talking about um, uh, loans, this could be the income of the customer and the amount of money that the customer uh, asks for in, in, his, in his loan application. So this is pretty much telling the user that if you're going to use this model, then your expected performance will be, I don't know, 80% accuracy or whatever. But in these particular areas, it's going to perform know even better than that and for customers such as this with these characteristics the model is going to work better than that and for customers with these other set of characteristics then the model is going to worse, work worse than that so maybe you might want to be careful when you use the model on those particular areas so this is very of course this is very useful for the end user but i also like to think that there is a need to provide some information for the data scientists that develop the model. And the data scientists that develop the model or researchers, machine learning researchers that develop algorithms are interested in the behavior of models or the behavior of algorithms, not in terms, not so much in terms of the base level domain, the, the, the variables like the income of the customer or the, the age of the customer, but they would like to relate that, to relate the performance of the algorithms uh, to concepts that they understand. So for instance, uh, if I can somehow measure the linearity of a frontier, instead of describing this red area as the area where you know, the age of the customer is greater than this and the income of the customer is less than that, if I can characterize it in terms of measures of linearity of the concept, then I could have a measure, so I could get a uh, rule that tells me, you know, if the linearity of the frontier in a subgroup, in a subspace, is um, lower than the linearity in the whole population, then the linear discriminant won't work as well, okay? So this is obvious, right? Of course, if, if the frontier is less linear than a linear algorithm or a linear model, we have more, more trouble. But I would like to uh, get this kind of uh, knowledge or meta-knowledge that uses 
concepts, which are not base level concepts, they are meta level concepts. So there, these are characteristics of the data. So let's, uh, and the way we're going to do that, we, we, the way we did this was using uh, meta learning. And of course, before now uh, going into how we do that, let me give you my, my uh, five minute course on how to do uh, on, on meta learning. So traditionally, and I know recently this is not be the case, but we have been working on this for several, on this thing we call meta learning for many years. And what we call meta learning is, was used essentially for something called algorithm selection. And the problem of algorithm selection is very simple. We deal with it every day, I guess. And it is, you know, I have a new problem, let's say a Schoen prediction problem, and my portfolio in my machine learning tool, I have two algorithms. I have a decision tree and I have a random forest. And this is of course, without uh, loss of uh, generality, you can do this with as many algorithms uh, as you'd like. But now I have to decide which algorithm to use. And of course the typical approach is I run a decision tree on my data set. I run a random forest. I assess the performance. I measure the performance using an adequate resampling strategy, holdout, cross-validation, I don't know, your favorite uh, method. So I measure the expected, the, the, the estimated predictive performance of these algorithms, and then I choose the best. So this is the typical approach to choosing an algorithm. Uh, uh, our motivation in meta learning is that I have ran a decision tree and I have ran a random forest in many other data sets. And I know that, for instance, in this Iris data set, the decision tree is better than a random forest. And on the house votes data set that I ran last week, random forest was better than decision tree. So our motivation is or our reasoning is, can't we use, can't we systematically use the experience that I've gained from previous experiments that I did to, to help me make this decision? So is there some way I can say that my churn prediction problem, the one that I'm trying to solve right now, is more similar to the Iris data set? So I, ch I should choose the decision tree, or on the other hand, the churn prediction problem that I'm trying to address right now is more similar to the house votes data set. And so I should use a random forest. So what we try to do is actually systematize this in a very simple way. Basically what we do is we represent each data set that I have already processed in the past. So for instance, here is Iris. I represent this data set in some kind of Euclidean space. And this is one data set. This is another data set. In this case, random forest was the best. And this is another data set and so on. So I have, I've, in the past, I've processed five data sets. So now what I want to do is when a new data set comes in, I'm going to basically try to position this data set in this Euclidean space. And when I do that, then I can use any machine learning algorithm, you know, for, for Illustration purposes, I've added nearest neighbor here, and I will use the nearest neighbor and or any other algorithm, and I will make a prediction. And in this case, since the most similar data sets to my new data set is where data sets where random forest was the best, I'm going to recommend to use the random forest. So this is a very simple approach to uh, meta learning, but I forgot to mention a very important detail, which was how to represent this, which is a data set, a matrix, in a Euclidean space like this, as a single point in Euclidean space, which I cannot do directly. So what we've been doing for many years in meta learning was actually compute what we call meta features that are characteristics of the data set. Things as simple as, for instance, the number of examples, or the number of attributes or you know, more complex stuff. Usually uh, use statistical measures or information theoretical measures 
or even more complex stuff uh, to represent each data set. So now each data set, which was a matrix on its own, now becomes a vector of these meta features. And once it becomes a vector, then I can represent it as it is, and I can apply any, um, any uh, machine learning algorithm. Now, my guess is that many of you have knowledge about computer vision or and other kinds of unstructured data, and you say, well, this is not much different from what we do in, you know, in other unstructured scenarios. So we could use embeddings and stuff like that. And uh, uh, we are doing some work in that direction, but still most of the approaches follow this very simple idea that you characterize. So you, you, you represent these data sets in Euclidean space by computing these meta features, these simple characteristics. Okay, so this was my five or 10 minute introduction to meta learning. Uh, if you want to know more about this, this is hot out of the press. The second edition of our book on meta learning, which was recently out. This is actually open uh, access book, so you can just uh, click on it and, and uh, read it. And there's also, if you're really interested in, in these topics of auto ML and meta learning, there's also another book, which is also open source, uh, uh, which is also available. So if you wanna go deeper into these things, so there's a lot of material already in this area. So in the first part, I tried to convince you that uh, I want to understand better how models and also how algorithms work, how algorithms work in particular sub areas of the space. And uh, I've shown you, I've uh, shown you meta learning and I'm now I'm going to show you how meta learning can be used for that purpose. So if you remember, so the idea is I want, if I have these areas where the behavior of the algorithms or the models is different from the, the average of the population, uh, so now what I uh, want to do is to uh, characterize these areas in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, these data characteristics, these meta features that I mentioned. So I'm not going into much detail here. So we, we, we have more experiments, but we didn't have the time yet to, to process the results. So basically what we did was we computed the accuracy of a random forest on, in this case, on a single data set, which is the adult data set, which is a standard benchmark. And we characterize each subgroup that we found according to this set of meta features. I won't go into detail about those, uh, but the main idea here is that we try to compute the distribution of the target uh, the, the, the distribution of the attributes, both, and we have, we have separate features for the quantitative attributes and for the qualitative attributes. And we also characterized the relationship between the attributes and the target. And these, these measures, they are not complete, they're not perfect, but they give you at least some information about each one. So basically we have characteristics of the target, characteristics of the attributes and characteristics of the relationship between the targets and the, 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 the attributes and the target. And when we feed this to a meta learning algorithm, so what we expect is to learn something about what are the characteristics of these areas where the algorithm works better and the and uh, uh, the results, and I only, I only have these results to show you right now. Uh, the results, uh, we, we could only get results for areas where random forest is better than average on the adult data set. So curiously, the, 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 our meta learning approach could not find any rules saying in, this, in data with these particular characteristics, the random forest will work worse 
than on average. Uh, so we're we're looking into that, but uh, have really not much not much clue of why that happens yet. For the rules that uh, we got concerning the increase in inaccuracy, uh, so uh, what the algorithm told us is that the if the average uh, mutual information increases on the subspace or also the relative canonical correlation of the best linear combination also increases, which is a complex way of saying that you have more information in either, the more information about the target in either the qualitative or quantitative attributes, then random forest improves performance. Now that's not really surprising, right? So if there is, a stronger relationship between the attributes and the target, then the model is expected to work better. But on the other hand, it's also nice to see that our approach is finding something which is obvious, right? So when it finds something which is not so obvious, then I think we'll be more confident about it. Uh, another rule we got was that uh, when we have more information in quantitative attributes, and less variance in the qualitative attributes. So, so they, take, they, they, they have less entropy, the, 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 quant the qualitative attributes, uh, then the accuracy also increases. And uh, so this kind, of, this kind of tells us, you know, that the random forest, you know, if the qualitative attributes don't contain, you know, they, they're not very informative, then it is able to get some interesting information out of the qualitative, quantitative attributes if they contain that information. Again, that's not particularly surprising, uh, but uh, but we're looking into. As I said, it's it's comfortable that that it gives us some things that we already know. And finally, um, one of the things that it says is that if there is more redundancy in the, not qualitative, but quanti this is wrong. If there's more redundancy in the quantitative variables, then the performance of the random forest also increases. And this one, I cannot really explain uh, why this could be true, uh, but it gives us, somehow it seems that you know, if there's a lot of redundancy in the quantitative variables uh, or the random forest doesn't waste much time uh, with that redundancy, or it could mean, it could be interpreted in another, another way, which is when, when there is more redundancy in the quantitative, when there is less redundancy in the quantitative variables, the random forest, uh, analyzes them more deeply, but doesn't really get any value for it because its performance doesn't decrease. Um, but as I said, we need to look into this deeper. Uh, we also have some results uh, with Naive Bayes already processed, to be honest. I, I only showed the results for Random Forest, but I'm not showing them because they're really counterintuitive. And uh, um, even concerning the assumption of independence between the attributes that Naive Base makes. And we're, we want to make sure that this is not a bug from our experiments before actually uh, presenting them, those results. Okay, so I promised this would be quick and that's it from my side. So basically, uh, we know that the performance of a model, we usually report the average performance of the model, but we know that that performance is usually not homogeneous across the data set. So we want to identify areas of, the, 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 of subspaces where the performance of the models and the algorithms is different from uh, uh, the average performance. And we're doing a combination of meta-learning and subgroup discovery methods to achieve that. Uh, the results are still very preliminary as I showed, but I, I'm really enthusiastic about them because 
I like the idea that we have some results which are kind of expected, and I like the idea that we, we also have some results which are not as expected. And of course, the experimental setup is pretty limited yet, only one algorithm, uh, one data set, um, uh, we're, as I said, working on it. Uh, and of course, obvious future work is to consolidate these this results, more algorithms, more data sets. I'm not going into detail, but our approach has a important flaw, which is, uh, well, it's it's not a, a conceptual flaw. It's just the results must be interpreted carefully, because uh, the subgroups are um, when we compute the interesting rules. Those rules that I showed you, those rules are computed by considering that each subgroup or each subspace of the data set, uh, they are all treated the same, all subspaces, which means that the subspace that contains a thousand examples has the same weight for our, our meta-learning algorithm as a subspace that only contains 10 examples. And that obviously is not a good thing. And we're, uh, Paul is actually working on this. And another thing I would like, so I would like to get some interesting information based on a single data set. But then I, I would also like to uh, gather subgroups from different uh, data sets. And since we're characterizing them, oops, since we're characterizing them using meta features which are, which are independent of the domain, I can, have on the, I can have on my meta data set different subgroups regardless of having, uh, because they are characterized according to the same characteristics, they can be, I can have data sets from health and finance and uh, whatever. So I would like to get knowledge that uh, is useful across different data sets. And basically this is it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Yes, we have time for questions. So if you have them, you can uh, either raise your hand and, and speak in, in the mic, or you can write them in the chat and I will read them or professor will read them and reply to them. Uh, I have a question uh, to start, uh, professor, which is apparently these methods uh, rely on, on meta features, which were selected based on some criteria, but I wonder if you could have some kind of meta meta selection of, of meta features so uh, for those meta features that you have selected you must have had some criteria on choosing them but uh, would it be possible to automate this choice of, of meta features uh, as well okay so my instinctive question to that my instinctive answer to that is no so basically what we did was we looked at random forests and we know that random forests, um, they, they are based on the decision tree algorithm, which is essentially based on entropy based uh, um, decisions, right? So it uses entropy a lot. So most of almost uh, all of our uh, measures they are related to uh, entropy, except for this last one and also this one, the second one. But most of them are based on entropy. And for naive Bayes, uh, what we are using is more, again, we're using entropy and also simple prob probability-based measures. So, I think the best way of doing this is if you understand how the algorithm works, you can do the right meta feature engineering. So this is my instinctive answer to that. Uh, another possibility and uh, following your suggestion, Dio, would be to generate systematically meta features and then apply some kind of meta level feature selection. Uh, and that actually uh, sounds like a 
a good idea. Uh, there is some work on the systematic generation of meta features. There's the work of Fabio Pinto, uh, who is currently in Automaze. There's the work of Adriano Rivoli, who is currently in Brazil. And then there's the work of Vitor Cerqueira for Time Series. Uh, he's in, uh, well, working for Canada. And there's also the work of um, people in Lisbon, in Nova. Um, forgot uh, their names now, uh, on systematic characterization, systematic meta-feature meta generation. So in that case, we could actually generate, so do a more data-oriented process, ge ge generate as much as you can, and then uh, do feature selection. Mm. Yes, I think that sounds like a, a good idea, but, but we're still, we're, we're old school. So we're still going for the first approach. We're looking at the algorithm and trying to come up with the best, uh, the features that you can actually interpret better. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we have more questions. Well, I have one which is kind of obvious, but I think I have to ask, ask it anyway. Uh, this method that you have presented uh, applies mostly to shallow methods or to tabular data, let's say. Uh, could we somehow extend it to more high-dimensional data like uh, image or, or text? Um, that works, of course. So we, we've, we've played with the idea of looking at internal representations of uh, neural networks as meta features, right? So for instance, if you have an embedding, you can look mm -hmm. at it as a meta description of an observation uh, in a space which you don't really know where it is, right? Uh, I like the idea and we've been, we, uh, Tia Cunha who is currently now, is now in Expedia in, Swiss, in Switzerland. He did some work on that for, for um recommender systems uh but there's one thing i don't like is the fact that i don't understand what is this space the data is being projected to mm -hmm. um so for text i've been starting to think about how can we generate meta features for text i don't know and when i mean is starting to think about it, I mean this week, because I have a new uh, person uh, that just started here in, in working with me. And uh, we were thinking about what kind of uh, assignment to give him. And one of the ideas was actually to use these kinds of things on, on NLP. And uh, by the way, if anybody knows how to compute meta features of text, I would very much like to hear about it. Uh, but we were starting to think about uh, looking at, and our approach is probably going to be looking at what people in linguistics have done to characterize text, and then try to somehow quantify that, and then use those as meta features. Uh, of course, with text, we will also have to use the internal representations. I think it, it uh, goes without saying. Um, for, for images, I really don't have any other idea except uh, the internal representations. By the way, one of the problems with internal representations, and if any of you, and you know more about deep learning than I do, if anybody can solve this, I would be, really like to hear about it, is that well, I can get the internal representation for a single example. But uh, if I'm looking at, let's say, if I'm looking at a set of images and I want to decide which is going to be the best algorithm for this set of images, I have not a single representation, but I have a set of representations. And I have a feeling that by averaging them, I'm not getting a good representation of the data set. I'm, I feel very uncomfortable about doing that. So if anybody has ideas on how to do this, on how to take the internal representation of a neural network and uh, and for multiple examples, and then come up 
with a general internal representation of the whole data set, I would very much like to hear about that. You could probably try to model the distribution and get the parameters of, of this distribution, but uh, maybe the distribution itself will vary across uh, data sets. So uh, it's definitely not easy, I think. Yeah, we cannot do it. I mean, if we, if we learn in the process, then I, I don't believe in it, right? Because if you learn in the process, the meaning of each, in, uh, if, if each element of the internal representation can, might change completely. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the model should be the same. Yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, but if we keep the same model, so the same weights for different data sets, I'm more or less uh, comfortable with it. Uh, computing the average, if ever, uh, the distributions, things like, for instance, the mean, mean, let's say mean, max, average, standard deviation, things like that. Okay, sounds like an idea. But that makes assumptions about how the weights distribute. And I, I don't know if there's any work discussing what are the distributions of internal representations. Uh, I think there is, but uh, I'm not. Okay. If you find something, please let me know. And I will look for it, for sure. We have more questions. Well, uh, I think we don't. So uh, thank you very much, Professor, for accepting our invitation and for giving us this talk. It was a pleasure for us to um, attend it. Okay. And thank you all uh, for your, your presence here and uh, we'll see you somewhere in the future. Thank you all. And thank you very much for the invitation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.